Okay, Dr. Sai. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the PCS webinar on the guidelines of the use of personal protective equipment by surgeons amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. This promises to be a very exciting and relevant webinar. And we have amongst us the leader. Dr. Sagil? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Pa. We will have the, an ecumenical prayer followed by the PCS hymn. Dr. Jerusalem? Pray. Lord, in the midst of all the uncertainty and unpredictability of these times, we glorify your name above all for giving us another day for learning and camaraderie with our friends. Thank you for keeping us safe and providing for us. Many things in our work life are changing that knowledge and professional skills require constant updating and improvement to further equip us so that we can continue to carry out our profession productively and to the best of our ability. Bless our organizers, our speakers, and participants today. They are your instruments in continuing the good work in the world. Remove from us the fear from our hearts as we face the many trials that seem unrelenting, be it the imminent threat of this pandemic to natural disasters and calamities by reminding us that you are greater and that we are your children. Continue to keep us in your love, cover us with your unfailing grace and protection that we may glorify Christ through our profession and in all that we do. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome everyone. We have a lot of participants. I saw 515 a moment ago. So this is the PCS web, uh, Menarini webinar on the guidance and the use of personal protective equipment by surgeons amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. The PCS Committee on Surgical Research has really put a lot of effort in coming out to these guidelines. We all know that the guidelines are just evolving and there will be changes, but at this time, currently, these are the best possible guidelines that the committee has come up with. So I am your host for today. I'm Dr. Esther Sagil, uh, President of Philippine Surgical Infection Society and also working hard uh, to give you the best data available on uh, surgical infection prevention and protection against COVID-19 infection. To give us our welcome remarks is Dr. Renato Bugi Montenegro from General Surgery. He's an assistant professor of the USD Faculty of Medicine and Surgery and a member of the Board of Regents of the Philippine College of Surgeons. Dr. Bugi. I don't think who is Dr. Bugi already around? I I think he's having problems entering the room. So Dr. Dofitas. When when, when 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 Doctor Montenegro logs in, then we could uh, call him for his remarks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I think that will be great. Yeah, he's having problems entering uh, uh, the webinar. So we have an exciting lineup of of um, lectures for you. Uh, this will be the house rules for since you can be asking the questions uh, face to face or online. We will ask you to type your questions in the chat, chat box of the Zoom. And all of your questions will be addressed at the end of the five lectures. I will be introducing the five lecturers. We have really poured in a lot of effort into these guidelines. The first lecture will be delivered by Dr. Joyce Grace Jerusalem of General Surgery. She is the chair and faculty of the Department of Surgery, Genelta Foundation, School of Medicine in the Perpetual Health Medical Center in Las Piñas, and she is also the chair of the PCS Committee on Surgical Research. She will be delivering the lecture on the terminologies, levels, levels of PPE, and creation of hospital zones amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. The second lecture will be delivered by Dr. Ida Marie Lim, also of General Surgery. She is Assistant Professor 3 of the USD Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, and a medical specialist at the Jose R. Reyes Memorial Medical Center. She will be delivering a lecture on the uses of PPE according to the areas in the hospital. The third lecturer is Dr. Joselito Mendoza, also generous of general surgery, is a member of the Board of Regents of the Philippine College of Surgeons. He is also the regent in charge of the PCS Committee on HMO, RBS, and PhilHealth. And last but not the least, Dr. Rodney DeFitas, also from General Surgery, will be delivering a lecture on the specifications of the surgical gowns and coveralls. He is an Associate Professor 7 of the UP College of Medicine and is also a member of the Board of Regents of the Philippine College of Surgeons. So all our lecturers will be delivering their lectures uh, successively. And please type in all your questions because we will be addressing them during the open forum at the end of all these lectures. So may we now give the screen I to asked, Dr. Yes? Steph, I'm sorry. I think uh, Dr. Montenegro is already in since the start. Okay. Very yes, good. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay. So to deliver the, again, to introduce Dr. Montenegro, a member of the Board of Regents of the Philippine College of Surgeons and Assistant Professor of the USD Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, Dr. Boogie. Baka i-unmute lang natin siya. I-unmute. The, the, ano, should unmute him. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Yeah. Baka, Jeff, can we unmute or... Uh, Share video. I of think Dr. he came in. Okay. 
Sige, sir. Okay. Okay, he's here now. Yeah. Okay. This is in. Okay, great. Can we give the screen to Dr. Montenegro? Yeah, okay. Oh, finally, Esther. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Esther. you, Esther. Great, great. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> great. And the, uh, yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In behalf of the PCS Board of Regents and the President of the College, Dr. Chito Salud, I would like to welcome all of you to this web-based seminar on the rational use of personal protective equipment during this COVID pandemic. We are getting better at this platform, <laughs> though I'm not too comfortable speaking <laughs> in front of a gadget. But we've realized that this pandemic will change the way we do a lot of things as we carefully and agonizingly move to the new normal. Since the pandemic started and eventually the lockdown, the PCS has issued nine advisories and guidelines which were sent to the fellows by email, circulated in Viber, Facebook, and in the PCS website. The latest being the rational use of personal protective equipment. Among the guidelines, this latest has generated the most reactions, questions, and not a few harsh comments. We understand the reactions as all of us are learning in this unprecedented pandemic that at the present time is still evolving. We do not know for sure how long these guidelines will be applicable as events continue to unfold. We find these guidelines in webinar very timely as we are all eager to get back to our respective surgical practice. The objective therefore of this session is to disseminate and explain the guidelines. Let me thank the research committee of the college headed by Dr. Rodney Topitas who searched for the evidences that were used in the manuscript. The board spent several nights zooming in from one version to another until we agreed in the final form. Although it is ideal to just dispose of used PPE once done, we need to anticipate the requirements for the possible disparity in supply and demand for the immediate and unpredictable future of this pandemic. Because of this, in addition to setting the rules for the rational use of PPE, the guidelines also discusses the so-called crisis capacity strategies that include the extended use or limited reuse of PPE and reprocessing methods. These are acceptable alternatives to the ideal standard of disposing used PPE. This may be necessary to conserve the supply without compromising the safety of the healthcare workers. In creating these guidelines, the overall concern were, number one, most important, protection of the healthcare workers, specifically the surgical team inside the operating room, scarcity of and therefore prioritization of the use of PPEs, and number three, on the practical aspect, that the guidelines be doable considering the different capabilities of our hospital. The guideline, as I've said, may evolve and we be careful in the choice of words. For example, we avoided using terms like mandatory, but rather in one statement, as an example, we said consider testing the pre-op patient rather than say the test is mandatory for pre-op patients. The entire board, I am sure, is logged in to this webinar, as we know that there is so much to learn from our colleagues in the surgical field. Let me thank all the speakers and Madam Moderator for accepting the invitation at very short notice. Finally, let me also thank Menarini for making this and previous webinars possible. We look forward to partnering with you in this kind of platform. Again, good morning and you all take care. Thank you, Th thank you, thank you, Dr. Montenegro. We could hear you loud and clear. Dr. Montenegro, so without further ado, okay, there is a storm brewing somewhere, we're signal numbered, but you now have no excuse. We have 667 participants at this time and it's still going up. I would like to give the screen now to Dr. Joy Jerusalem. 
for the lecture on terminologies, levels of PPE, and creation of hospital zones. So without further ado. Uh, good morning, colleagues and friends. Um, welcome to this webinar on the rational use of the PPEs. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, our partners in this webinar, uh, Menarini and the Telemedicine Network of the Philippines, who have been assisting us in all of the previous webinars so far. So, so I was assigned to talk on the common terminology, the levels of PPE, and creation of hospital zones uh, during this COVID pandemic. So I will be discussing mostly the terminology that are relevant uh, in the discussion of our personal protective equipment and terminology that you will be hearing repeatedly throughout the talk in the other lectures as well. I will also the, um, discuss uh, some local, locally used schemes in classification of our PPEs and strategies in zoning of the hospital. Uh, to successfully cohort the, and conserve uh, the use of our PPEs. So personal protective equipment, these are our uh, special coverings that are designed to protect us, the healthcare uh, personnel and workers, from exposure to or contact with infected agents. At the same time, wearing the PPEs can also help prevent microorganisms from health professionals from spreading to our patients. So the routes of exposure in infectious uh, phenomenon include inhalation, contact, uh, spread mucous membrane, and ingestion. And therefore, there are three main protective equipment uh, categories. And these include our respirators, uh, eye protection, and protective clothing. Now, we'll talk about healthcare personnel. This will include the medical and paramedical personnel employed by the hospital, including perhaps the medical students and also the trainees in the more technical aspects of um, diagnostics and the laboratory. And we also include here uh, the contractual staff who are not employed by the healthcare facility in terms of healthcare service. But these are, of course, Though they are not directly involved in patient care, they could be exposed to infectious agents that are found in the healthcare setting. So these are examples of your personal protective equipment. So depending on the hazard, uh, the recommendations on the use of PPEs change. So as a standard practice, uh, the picture on your right shows you the standard precautions, uh, gloves, uh, mask, and uh, gown. But of course, if um, the infectious agent is blood-borne uh, or possibly airborne as well, there are cases of high infection in the area, then expanded precautions will be added on. And this will include uh, respirators, goggles, uh, coveralls, protective shoes, uh, protective covers, etc. Okay. Now, donning means uh, putting on the recommended PPE, and doffing refers to taking off or removal of the worn PPE. And there are several protocols that we know, uh, and these are actually in wide use already uh, in different hospitals. Okay. On the face mask, uh, it's often referred to as the surgical mask or procedure mask, and most of them should be FDA cleared. Uh, and these surgical masks that undergo um, evaluation are designed to actually protect us from splashes and sprays and are prioritized for use in the healthcare facility when such exposures are anticipated, including, of course, surgical procedures. Now, the use of face masks that are not regulated by FDA are typically used for isolation purposes, but, and they may not protection from splashes and sprays. Now, the respirator is a type of equipment that is worn over the face. It covers at least the nose and the mouth. And it's, it functions or used to reduce the wearer's risk for inhaling hazardous worn particles, including dust 
and infectious agents, gases, or vapors. Uh, respirators are certified by the CDC and the NIOSH, including those intended for use in healthcare facilities. So there are two types of respirators. The first one are the air purifying respirators. These remove contaminants from the air and they include the particulate respirators which filter out airborne particles and the gas mask which filter out chemicals and gases. Now, there are different types of particulate respirators. Uh, particulate filtering phase piece respirators, these are commonly the disposable types. They are discarded when it becomes unsuitable for further use uh, due to considerations of hygiene, uh, if it's soiled, uh, excessive resistance, or physical damage. So an example of these are our N95s. And then we have the elastomeric respirators. So these are half uh, half face and the full face respirators. They are reusable in the sense that uh, most of the respirate the elastomeric respirators have a face piece that can be cleaned and reused, but they also have filter cartridges that are discarded and replaced when they become unsuitable for further use. We have the power air purifying respirators or the PAPAs. They protect the user by filtering out contaminants in the air. And it uses a battery operated blower to provide the user with clean air through a tight fitting respirator, a loose fitting hood or a helmet. Okay. A word on the N95. So, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health Respirator Approval Regulation defines the term N95 to refer to any type of filter that removes 95% of airborne particles during worst case testing. So it uses the most penetrating sized particle during the NIOSH testing. So filters actually meet the criteria that meet the criteria of removing at least 95 or given the rating of 95. And those meeting this filtration performance are often referred to simply as your N95 respirators. Okay. Um, in most of the literature, uh, some of them are saying that the N95 might not be a good respirator against coronavirus because they keep citing that uh, the minimum microns that the N95 respirator can filter is at 0.3 microns. But there are several uh, empiric um, uh, data studies that showed that even if coronavirus is about uh, 0.12 microns, the N95, the particulate respirators, are still able to filter this out successfully. Now, a word also on the KN95. So, the KN95 is actually the counterpart of the N95 of the US, but manufactured in China. And according to 3M, it is actually reasonable to consider it as an alternative or an equivalent to the N95. Other mask standards uh, for Europe, the FFP2, in Australia, the P2. Uh, the KMOEL in Korea and DS in Japan are also highly similar. So what are the main differences between the N95 and the KN95? So in both cases, they are able to capture 95% of uh, 0.3 micron particles. The main difference is in the manufacture of the KN95, the Chinese government actually requires the manufacturer of these masks to run fit tests in humans and come up with at least uh, less or equal to 8% of leakage. N95 on the other hand um, have uh, slightly stricter, uh, stricter requirements uh, for pressure drop during inhalation and exhalation. So it means that they are required to be slightly more breathable than KN95 masks. Not to say that in the U.S. the N95 are not subject to fit tests, but usually the fit tests are done by uh, the operator or the one who is going to use the mask. Okay. So our filtering phase P masks or FP, so we all see this uh, abbreviation. Uh, these protect against particulates such as uh, dust particles and various uh, viruses in the air. So it's an example of a mechanical filter respirator. 
Uh, the EN149 standard, establish, which establishes the minimum characteristics of respiratory protection equipment based on uh, aerosol filtration percentage and internal leak rate, defines further uh, the filtering face piece mask in categories, namely your FFP1, FFP2, and FFP3. So FFP1 is the least filtering mask of the three. It has an aerosol filtration percentage of 80% minimum and has an internal leak rate of as high as uh, 22%. And it's mainly used for dust, dust mask during DIY jobs, uh, carpentry, etc. And it can be identified based on the color of the elastic that's used in the masks. It's usually yellow. Then your FFP2, has a slightly higher uh, filtration percentage, not less than 9%, with an internal rate of 8%. And the mask can actually serve as protection against the different viruses. Uh, it's similar to the N95 mask, and the color of the elastic is either blue or white. And then we have the FFP3. Uh, its aerosol filtration percentage is not less than 99% with an internal leak rate of 2%. The FFP is the most filtering of all the FFP masks and it can protect against very fine particles like asbestos and ceramics. However, it does not uh, protect against gases, in particular nitrogen oxide. And the elastic color used for the FFP3 is red. Now, a word also on the exhalation valves. We see a lot of masks that have these divs uh, attached to it. This valve actually allows the exhaled air to escape because it's currently found in FFP3s because it's, uh, the mask itself uh, is a bit uh, thick. So sometimes if you don't have this valve, there will be condensation uh, in the user side of the mask. So this exhalation valve will actually allow uh, or avoid the condensation and prevent the filter from becoming less permeable and unpleasant to wear. Uh, unfortunately, the presence of this exhalation valve uh, will also allow expired air to go out. And uh, it is of note that it actually allows unfiltered air coming from the uh, hospital uh, care personnel to freely exit the mask. So the patients or the people around that particular personnel might not be uh, protected if they're not wearing protective gear as well. Okay, now there are different types of respirators. There are tight fitting respirators and these types need a tight seal between the respirator and the face uh, and or the neck of the respirator user in order to work properly. And if the respirator seal leaks, uh, contaminated air will be pulled into the face piece and it can be in. So anything that interferes with the respirator seal is not permitted when you are using tight-fitting respirators. And these will include facial hair, earrings, head scarves, wigs, and facial piercings. Now, for, uh, for tight-fitting respirators, it is important to do fit testing. So it's done to be sure that respirator's face piece fits your face and it should be done before you actually use it, especially for the first time. And it has been uh, recommended that you have to retest at least every 12 months to be sure that the respirator continues to fit your face. Not to be confused with the user seal check. The user seal check is a quick check performed by the wearer every time he or she puts on the respirator. And this uh, test actually determines if the respirator is properly seated to the face or if it needs to be readjusted. So loose fitting respirators conversely uh, do not depend on the tight seal. It can be a helmet type or a hood type and they do not need to be fit tested. So the other type of respirators what we call are supplying respirators. And these actually protect us by supplying clean air from another source. So they are also called atmosphere supplying respirators. And the types that fall under this category include your airline respirators that use compressed air from a remote source. So it connects to a tube to the source. 
and also self-contained breathing apparatus, which include their own uh, air supply. So the air supply and respirators are the only type that can be used in a work atmosphere that lacks sufficient oxygen. And if it is oxygen deficient or if the area is contaminated to the point of being immediately dangerous to life or health. Okay. Your assigned protection factor or APF, this is a measure of the respirator's protection capability. It represents the level of protection from airborne exposure each class of respirators are, is expected to provide. So the larger the number, the greater the level of protection. So for example, if the respirator has an APF of 10, it reduces the exposure uh, to one of the concentration of the contaminant avail um, present in the air. Now for filter material, Classifications. This is actually used uh, if the environment you're working in will have a significant amount of oil in the environment. So the first part of the filters classification uses the letters N, R, or P, indicate the filter's ability to function when it is exposed to oils. So N means it's not resistant, R somewhat resistant to oil, and P strongly resistant to oil or oil proof. So the second part uh, refers to the filter's ability to remove the most penetrating particle size during worst case uh, testing. Okay. So under protection, we have different equipment as well. Goggles are highly effective as eye protection, uh, although they do not provide splash or spray protection to the other parts of the face. And depending on the type of goggles that you use, there are some goggles that do not, do not have the adequate lateral protection, or if it's vented at the sides, then it will still be, if uh, you're in a splash in, in environment, it might not uh, protect from splash if it goes through the lateral portions of the, of the eye. Face shields, on the other hand, will provide better face and eye protection from splashes and sprays. And a face shield, uh, to be effective, it should have a crown to chin protection and wrap around the face up to the point of the ear to reduce the likelihood that the splash could go around the edge of the shield reach the eyes. Uh, glasses provide impact protection but do not necessarily provide the same level of splash or droplet protection as goggles and generally should not be used for infection control purposes. Uh, full face respirators, although they are designed and used for respiratory protection, because of the design, uh, it includes, uh, they might incidentally also provide effective eye and face protection. Okay, protective clothing, uh, although there are no standard nomenclatures yet to describe uh, particular properties, uh, there, are two th there are actually three that is worth noting. Uh, the term with resistant applies to the protective clothing tested against water in a liquid challenge. Impermeability or impermeable means materials that have uh, demonstrated blockage of microorganisms using a record standard test method. Uh, critical fabric and clothing properties include strength properties of the fabric and seams, uh, including tensile strength and seam strength, barrier properties of the seams and closure, size of the garment, etc. So other factors such as compliance with regulatory uh, agencies, durability, abrasion resistance, tensile strength, seam strength, comfort uh, with respect to breathability, air permeability, flammability, electrostatic properties, cost, um, availability, ergonomic human factors, and integration with other types of PPE are important characteristics to take, a, um, take into consideration when choosing the proper protective clothing in your healthcare institution. So, the two most common are the cover, coveralls and the gown. So comparing the two, the coverall will be able to provide a more complete coverage. Some coveralls also include hoods over the head. So it provides a 360-degree coverage as opposed to the gown, 
uh, that may leave some parts of the back or down to the mid calf open and exposed. But between the two, the easiest to use and what we're used to is the gown. Uh, but of course, if you're a very high risk uh, for transmission area, you would want a full coverage of the coverall. The other protective clothing would be, of course, our gloves, uh, the head covers, caps, shoe covers, and boots. Uh, airborne infection isolation rooms. Uh, these are single patient rooms with negative pressure relative to the surrounding areas and with a minimum six air changes per hour. 12 air exchanges are recommended for new construction or renovation. Uh, air outside of these rooms should be exhausted directly to the outside or be filtered through a high efficiency particulate air uh, or HEPA filter directly before circulation. Room doors should be kept closed except when entering or leaving the room and entry and exit points should be minimized. Facilities should also monitor and document the proper negative pressure function of these rooms. So aerosol generating procedures or AGP. So this refers to procedures that uh, may uh, cause uh, certain particles or even viruses to join the environment in the air. And these include um, any type of manipulation to the airway, either for access uh, or during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. They include uh, dental procedures, which usually employ the use of high-speed drilling equipment, and even surgical procedures, uh, including high-energy devices, you know, high-speed cutters and drills, um, powered instrumentations, and even suction microdebridors, and also several types of ventilation, uh, the process of induction of tum, uh, gastrointestinal endoscopy, and also evacuation of pneumoperitoneum during laparoscopic procedures. Now, if you look at midlines on the rational use, uh, we are actually in a, a situation where we are uh, trying to, as much, as much as possible, conserve our PPEs. And surge capacity refers to the ability of an institution to manage a sudden, unexpected ease in patient volume. So that would otherwise severely challenge or exceed the present capacity of the facility, be it for supplies and uh, personal protective equipment or, or including, of course, manpower. So the CDC optimization strategies in conserving PPEs, um, they have three general strata that have been used to define surge capacity. And these can actually be used to prioritize measures to conserve your PPEs. So conventional strategies would include your standard practice. Uh, contingency strategies, uh, this is when the shortages are anticipated. And crisis capacity strate strategies, uh, these are employed when, they are all when we are already faced with severe shortages. So example of this, examples of these um, strategies are extended use. So this refers to the practice of wearing the same PPE for repeated close contact encounters with several patients without removing them from patient encounters. And they can be implemented when multiple patients are in with the same respiratory pathogen and patients are placed together in a dedicated room or hospital ward. Extended use has actually been recommended as an option for conserving respirators during uh, previous respiratory pathogen outbreaks and pandemics. Uh, reprocessing or use, uh, it's a process to de decaminate using disinfection or sterilization methods. Reuse refers to the practice of using the same PPE for multiple encounters with patients, but removing uh, docking off uh, after each encounter. It is stored in between encounters to be put on again prior to the next encounter with the patient. Uh, limit reuse refers to uh, limiting the number of times that the PPE is reused. Decontamination refers to the process of decreasing antimicrobials in an area or on a surface. Disinfection refers to the elimination of virtually all pathogenic organisms on inanimate objects, 
and surfaces, thereby raising the level of microbial contamination to an acceptably safe level. Sterilization is a process of destruction of all forms of living microorganisms from a surface of a substance. Cohorting is actually one of the strategies uh, by which uh, patients with the same diagnosis are placed together in a common area. So a lot of our COVID uh, infection centers uh, already uh, have this in place in their hospitals. And it is a great feasible strategy if the hospital is managing large numbers of uh, this particular disease. And since all the patients in this setup would be COVID positive, the issue of transmissibility between patients is eliminated by this process. So when we speak of a COVID area, it's usually a space or a place in the hospital, whether it's a private room or an emergency room, where probable or confirmed COVID cases stay for a significant period of time, so more than six hours, or where potentially aerosol generating procedures are performed. We go now to the levels of PPE. Actually, if you go to uh, the OSHA or the Environmental Protective Agency sites, you'll notice that depending on the industry, levels of PPE are actually um, different. In OSHA and EPA, um, level A is designated as um, the type of PPEs that you should be using uh, if you are in a very high-risk um, environment. For our purposes, we will be using um, the scheme uh, in use in the PGH uh, by the Hospital in Infection Control Unit. And they designate it as level one for um, the low-risk areas and the level four for the high-risk areas. So under level one PPEs, this includes surgical mask, uh, frequent hand hygiene practices, for level two, surgical mask, uh, goggles, or uh, a face shield. Level three PPE, uh, N95 mask, uh, goggles, or face shield, gloves, uh, surgical cap, scrub suits, gowns or coveralls, and shoe covers. And level four PPE, N95 mask, or your PAPR if you have it, goggles, face shields, double gloves, surgical cap, Scrub suits, coveralls, uh, dedicated shoes, and shoe covers. Now, zoning, uh, if you remember the hierarchy of controls, uh, the PPE is actually the least effective, and it should always be used in conjunction with good um, admi administrative engineering controls uh, for it to be effective. As one of the practical strategies in conserving our PPEs, it is important for institutions to be able to separate the non-COVID from the COVID patients. Um, the zoning of the hospital in terms of uh, patients in the COVID areas will depend on the risk of transmission. We are using this scheme that again is used in PGH. Uh, they determine the different zones based on the risk of transmission from the COVID uh, areas. And the green zone is uh, designated for low risk. So this includes the non-COVID areas, areas where physical distancing or no close contact with patients are possible. The orange zone is uh, designated for moderate risk. So these are the areas where there is provision of direct care to COVID-19 patients in the absence of aerosol generating procedures. And the red zone is designated for the high risk areas where there is direct care to COVID-19 patients in settings where aerosol generating procedures are frequently in place. I think that is my last slide. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosalem. That was a lot of information, but and I'm sure our attendees have some questions already. Um, we noticed that there were some brands. No, this is in by no means an endorsement of a brand, but rather the type you know, and the type of respirator. Um, you've been mentioning something about FDA, and I believe we are referring mainly to US FDA rather than local FDA um, endorsements. Um, regarding a lot of your talk, has something to do with the uh, PPEs being received by many hospitals, particularly those which are donated. 
PPEs. So we have a lot of donated PPEs and sometimes you're not very sure if they are adherent to the minimum standards that are required. So we'll be um, getting the question, answering the questions of our participants uh, later during the end. We'll now to get, go to our second speaker, Dr. Ida Lim, who will be talking about the use of PPEs according to the areas. So Dr. Lim. Yes, um, good evening to everyone. And I'm um, grateful not to be part of this group and uh, to be uh, able to help in whatever way I can. Okay. So at this point, now we are about two months from the start of the ECQ. And if you would recall now from that uh, chaotic situation we were all in, uh, hopefully by this time, um, we have a semblance of adjusting to the new normal. Uh, such that we have in place already um, administrative controls and engineering controls not to help um, protect the healthcare personnel. And as mentioned by Dr. Joy, the PPE is the lowest na, in the hierarchy so that we have to complement it with um, clear policies in the hospital, um, cohorting of patients na, into the high-risk zone, the COVID areas, and the non-COVID areas. So I have been tasked to present um, the specific um, PPE use with regards to uh, the different areas in the workplace. Next slide, please. So uh, one in the emergency room complex. We can divide this no, into um, the low-risk to the high risk area. Um, we have the triage area wherein we do preliminary screening for prioritization of care according to severity. So in the triage, as long as um, you're able to maintain physical distance no, of at least one meter, ideally you should have um, your engineering controls. You have built um, screens, a barrier between the healthcare worker and the patients. A level one PPE is sufficient and also your hand hygiene. However, if physical distance is not feasible, um, we recommend level two, uh, which includes the use of your uh, face shields or your goggles and also hand hygiene is important. Next slide. Now inside the emergency, emergency room setting, no, we have to, um, classify this, now whether in that area, you have the aerosol generating procedures and the area where uh, without the aerosol generating procedures and the area which is considered high risk or the hot zone. So if um, in the place you have no aerosol generating procedures, level three PPE would be adequate. And don't forget again your um, to do hand hygiene and in the area where uh, there could be aerosol generating procedures, level four PPE um, is recommended. So um, this also means that in every hospital we're working in, there should be uh, good engineering controls. So you have designated areas um, for the COVID, for those who are high risk, and also um, for those which are of moderate risk. Next slide. Now in the outpatient department, at this point, um, I don't think uh, we are entertaining patients no, in the OPD, but once the ECQ has been lifted and we're gradually um, entertaining patients, no, we should also be aware of uh, the proper PPE. Now in the OPD, it is advised that you should have a triage area. We advise that um, you screen patients um, before they come to the hospital using telemed uh, so that you are, would be more or less assured uh, that uh, the patients coming do not have COVID symptoms or they have been cleared already you know, by a test. So here the activity in the OPD triage is preliminary screening and does not involve direct contact. So the risk level is low. If you can maintain the distance of one meter, um, you have barriers in place, level one PPE would be adequate and perform hand hygiene. Now, if the physical distance is not feasible, 
uh, there are no barriers, uh, we advise using level two PPE. So aside from the surgical mask, you should also um, use face shield or goggles and hand hygiene. Next slide. Inside the consultation room, no, um, you can have an area uh, considered low to moderate risk for those with moderate risk. Um, the activity here for the low to moderate risk are those without symptoms of COVID. And for the moderate risk, these are those with symptoms of COVID. Now remember, this is the OPD. Uh, we do not want patients um, with the symptoms and without two uh, uh, to mix inside the OPD. No? So there should be a system of um, giving them appointments or schedules no? um, for the patients that you have screened, that you're sure they are clear from COVID. You can assign certain days that they can come. And then for the services which um, cater to patients at high risk of um, transmitting infection, no? for example, um, for medicine, pulmonary patients, or TCVS, uh, you assign a certain day no? so that we minimize contaminating the place and also um, affecting the healthcare personnel. So if you're assured that um, in that time, no, in that place of the OPD, you have low to moderate risk, level 2 PPE, and if you have that moderate risk of transmission, uh, you're seeing patients with uh, respiratory symptoms, then a level 3 PPE uh, should be used. Next slide. Now inside the rooms of the patient, no? um, again, there should be cohorting. No? Um, you have a designated COVID ward and also uh, the rooms for the non-COVID patients. So those without symptoms, these are low to moderate risk. Um, PP, level two PPE would be adequate. And for the COVID areas, uh, this is considered high risk, level 3 PPE is recommended. Next slide. In the OR, no, um, initially, we, there was a um, recommendation no, that we consider all patients as COVID uh, suspects so that we have to protect ourselves no, so that a full PPE should be used. By this time, now when there is already um, testing, and you can probably now um, have a separate uh, facility you know, for the COVID and the non-COVID patients. Now, in the OR, uh, this, if this is a local or regional anesthesia, there are no aerosol-generating procedures, and you are doing surgery on COVID positive or probable patients, no? the risk is still high. Level three PPE is recommended. So this means um, you use your gown, an N95 um, surgical mask, and uh, other uh, protective clothing. Now, if um, aerosol generating procedures are to be done, as um, mentioned earlier by Dr. Rejoy, level four PPE is recommended. So here you have double gloves and the coveralls and the other protective clothing. Next slide. Now, um, this was already mentioned no? um, in our hospitals, in the respective hospitals, you should be familiar now with the different zones. Uh, the green zone, the orange, and the hot zone, and the risk for transmission, and more or less uh, the level of PPE that should be worn. Now, since we are into rational use, it is also important to more or less assign the healthcare personnel no, who will be assigned to the low risk, moderate, and high risk, um, prepare the duty schedule so that we can allot, um, allot for the need for the PPE no, for uh, one day for the one week and uh, assure uh, continuous supply of your PPE. Next slide. Okay. So just to show, no, um, again, the when do we need to wear a level three PPE? Uh, if the stays only less than four hours, 
in a moderate to high risk zone, brief interaction with patients. Now you're taking the history, doing physical exam, other procedures, uh, even including uh, taking the swabs or assigned as a safety officer, level three PPE would be adequate. Next slide. However, if the stay is more than four hours, you have close contact with these patients. Examples will be carrying the patient, changing the bed linen, suctioning, performing oral or ET tube care, um, performing CPR, and exposed to aerosol generating procedures, level four PPE is recommended. Okay. I think that's the last slide no, for this segment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alim. Okay, our third speaker will be talking to us about a very um, interesting and sometimes contentious topic, and that is about the uses the use of masks and respirators, as well as face shields and protectors. So, one of our um, members of the board of directors of board of regents of the Philippine College of Surgeons, Dr. Joey Mendoza. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, Joey. So, um, yes, Joey. Nice. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me, uh, research committee, presenting uh, today's webinar. My topic will be more on the description of each uh, personal protective equipment, uh, dealing more on specifications, uh, recommended use and extended use, and reprocessing methods. So I will be dealing with the five first uh, PPEs, uh, including the surgical masks, the goggles and face shields, respirators, PAPRs, and the elastomeric masks and filters. Okay, the first surgical masks, uh, these are antibacterial, uh, smell-proof, dust-proof, has to be at least uh, three-ply. This is recommended for level one and level two uh, caregivers or care health workers, uh, those not directly handling COVID-19 patients and those without uh, exposure to risk of uh, splashing or spraying of blood and body fluids. Uh, reprocessing is definitely not recommended for face masks. As well as uh, for cloth masks, these are not considered alternatives to the surgical mask. The second PPE, the eye protection uh, goggles and face shields. These are usually anti-fog, made of polycarbonate material. They are lightweight with adjustable head straps. And for the face shields, this must cover at least the side of the face and up to below the chin for better protection. These are recommended for those involved in uh, performing uh, aerosol generating procedures like endoscopy, tracheostomies, or intubation. Also for them uh, using directly caring for a cohort of COVID-19 patients and those involved in procedures uh, involving splashing again or spraying of blood and bodily fluids. Extended use and limited reuse is acceptable. It should be discarded whenever there are damage ready to the uh, goggles, especially if you have stains or cracks on it, when the straps are already loose or when visibility is obscured. Okay. Reprocessing is acceptable. Now, how do you reprocess the goggles and face shields? Uh, the most common method is by washing it with soap and water, followed by disinfection, rinsing with water, then they're drying. Uh, the disinfecting materials used are as follows. Number one, you can soak it with 0.1 sodium hypochlorite solution for five minutes, or you can wipe it with 70% alcohol for another five minutes. Or a third option is to soak in hydrogen peroxide 3% for 30 minutes. An alternative method is using ultraviolet sterilization. Uh, there are cabinets available for this. You expose it for 15 minutes at a wavelength of uh, 253.7 nanometers or 1 to 1.2 joules per centimeter squared. The third PPE are the respirators, N95, N98, and so on, which uh, most commonly used nowadays are the N95. Uh, so the minimum efficiency should be 95% uh, uh, filtration efficiency. They should be fluid resistant. They have a nose clip and a two-strap two design. 
with a nasal foam on top. Fit testing is critical uh, when using the N95. So how do you fit test? How do you use uh, a qualitative uh, de detection by uh, various, uh, various sense of smell, taste, or involuntary cough? Or there is a quantitatively uh, test by using a port account respirator, a fit tester, like this model. And you can also use it with an accessory, a mass integrity test accessory for the elastomeric uh, mass. Uh, these are recommended for those involved or performing AGPs, for those directly caring for COVID, COVID patients, for those performing uh, with risk of splashing or spraying of blood and body fluids, and this can be used up to eight hours. Extended use between eight hours is safe and accepted as long as you maintain the fit and function of the respirator. Now, the following conditions can prevent extended use when it's soiled with blood or body fluids. After using with AGP procedures, you should discard of it. Following close contact with or exit from the care of a COVID-19 suspect or confirmed patients. Whenever there's damage to the respirator, torn uh, ear loops, and whenever it's hard to breathe through anything. Okay. Reuse is permitted as long as you follow the follow, uh, following provisions. Uh, first, uh, you can use the first method of rotating the N95 uh, between five to seven days. Uh, what you do is you use a brown bag. You use, like, say, the first respirator, the first N95, on day one, like a Monday, put it in a bag, then store it, then get another one for Tuesday, put it in another bag, and so on and so forth. Then once you get to the fifth or seventh one, you reuse the first one. Uh, the rationale is that uh, the time or amount of time in between use already exceeds the 72 hour survival of the virus. You should remember that when storing, you should hang them uh, in a designated uh, storage area. You should avoid the respirators touching each other while on storage. Uh, you should label the respirators for healthcare workers to minimize cross-contamination. And to extend the use also, you can put a face shield on top of the respirator or another uh, face mask on top of the N95. Uh, there are three decontaminating methods to uh, reprocess the N95. So first is the vapor of hydrogen peroxide, which is actually a steroid. The second is an ultraviolet irradiation. And the third is a steam or um, oven type. So the steroid, is a machine which uses low temperature gas plasma combined with hydrogen peroxide vapor to sterilize N95. Now, positive attributes are it has a rapid turnaround time, it's a cost effective, uh, doesn't produce any damage to the structure or form of the N95. It uses only a low concentration of uh, sterilizing agents, and there are no toxic residuals. So the second method is by using ultraviolet, either a lamp or a sterilizing cabinet, expose the N95 for 15 minutes. Uh, the University of Nebraska Medicine has uh, uh, developed a method of re-sterilizing the N95. Uh, the used N95s are placed in brown bags, then they are hung in a storage area and exposed to ultraviolet irradiation at a 300 microjoules per uh, centimeter. This is the machine put inside the room and remotely controlled. So once you hit the amount of irradiation, uh, ultraviolet irradiation, then you leave it there for 15 to 30 minutes. And once it's uh, re-sterilized, you put it in a white bag and ready for reuse by the healthcare workers. Okay, UBGI has been evaluated for mass integrity and it was found that there's a small decrease in the filtering capacity. However, it still remains, uh, it still remains within the parameter necessary to maintain the N95 rating. Okay. The last one is by using an oven, but it has to be at 70 degrees for 30 minutes. Uh, exposing the N95 to a high temperature of 160 uh, destroys the mass and destroys the structural integrity. And likewise, underheat at below 70 can result in incomplete inactivation of the coronavirus. 
It has been found that after 90 minutes of exposure, the, vi the virus was still viable. So how many times can you uh, reprocess the N95 with these methods? With the STIRAD, uh, you can use it up to five to 10 times. For the ultraviolet, only up to three times. And for the oven, up to 12 times. Uh, decontaminate, decontamination methods are not recommended uh, for the N95 but are, are as follows. Uh, immersion in alcohol, ethyl alcohol, uh, chlorine-based disinfectants, or soap and water. The reason is that it degrades the charged cotton layer of the N95, decreasing the filtering capacity. Also, surface wiping with these chemicals uh, do not result in decontamination of the inner layers of the N95. So the only way to decontaminate the inner layers is to soak it with this solution, which is actually not recommended. Next, we have the microwave or the autoclave. Uh, this uh, produces significant destruction of the N95 form and fit. And the last one, the ethylene oxide. It's actually a good uh, decontaminating method, but there are safety concerns in that the gas is flammable, explosive, and potentially carcinogenic. Go to the fourth PPE, which is the air uh, purifying respirator, so the PAPR. These are actually battery operated blowers, which forces the air through filter cartridges into the breathing zone of the wearer. Airflow is created inside the face piece or the hood, and this uses HEPA filters, which actually have a greater level of respiratory protection than NN5. Components of the PAPR uh, consist of a headgear or hood, a face shield, a head harness, that's a nose cap assembly, uh, has spectacles, uh, visor covers, inhalation and exhalation bulbs, port adapter, cartridge, PAPR system, belt, air hose, and battery chargers. Some useful information is that uh, they're better than the uh, N95, which are tight fitting, non powered air purifying respirators. It doesn't require a fit test anymore. It can be worn even if you have facial hair, unlike the N95, where the fit is not uh, all right when you have fa uh, facial hair. It, it has a significant splash protection also for the face and the eyes. Patients can see the healthcare worker, so this has better interpersonal uh, communications with the patient. It can be cleaned, disinfected, and reused and shared. This uh, less taxing also on a physiological resistance perspective uh, than other respirators. Okay. The limitations of the PAPR, uh, it may interfere with the user's uh, visual field, limited downward vertical view of field. Uh, the ability to hear is also reduced because of the blower noise inside the headgear. Uh, some surgeons who have used this uh, actually have to resort to um, sign languages just to communicate with one another because of the air. You really cannot hear anything. Also for the anesthesiologist, there's the ability to use the stethoscope is very limited. There's no way to put the earpiece of the stethoscope. And you have to have a lot of uh, uh, batteries. Uh, it has to be fully charged and you have to be, have a uh, standby battery on hand. It also requires a significant amount of storage space uh, in between uh, use. And for facilities or hospitals uh, employing this, you have to have a program for maintenance, for cleaning and proper disinfection. You have to have a lot of battery supply and formal training on donning and doffing because removal of the hood is more complicated. Then we have a new type of uh, PAPR, the clean space halo. Uh, this is used in conjunction with a goggle. It is a battery operated and lasts for eight hours uh, on a two-hour charge. That's a pre-filter and also an R99 filter, which is better than an N95. Uh, there's an indicator lamp also, which uh, lights up if the filter needs to be changed. Uh, according to the manufacturer, it takes six months to replace the filter. It's easy to breathe in. Uh, it blows air only on demand. Uh, there's a sensor that uh, senses an intake of breath, and that's when it blows the air. Advantages of the halo, uh, it's comfortable because it's made of silicon. It fits uh, any facial config, uh, configuration. There's no effort in breathing uh, and can easily be resanitized. Just use, uh, use Lysol wipes 
and put it in a UV cabinet. The limitations is that uh, this has an exhaust valve also, which is uh, uh, unfiltered. So to mitigate this, you can put a, a mask over the exhaust valve or 3D print an output uh, filter cartridge where you can put an N95 or a cut uh, piece of the face mask. It's not too heavy, but the weight pulls down on the mask to make the device rest on the shoulders. So to mitigate this, our quick fix is to use the strap which accompanies the, the halo. Again, with other respirators, it's hard to, to speak or to uh, communicate. Okay, the last PPE uh, are the elastomeric uh, respirators. During conventional use, these are just uh, used for industrial purposes, like for uh, painting when there is a smoke. And uh, maintenance is just cleaned with soap and water. But during this uh, crisis uh, era, during the surge demand, uh, this has been uh, recommended by the NIOSH uh, to be an alternative to the dwindling uh, amount or supply of N95 respirators. These are made of uh, synthetic or natural rubber and can be reused several times. Advantages, uh, first, uh, uh, there's minimal to zero fogging, as you can see in the upper picture. Uh, compared to when using just the N95 with goggles, once the person starts to perspire, then you have a lot of fogging and you cannot see anything anymore. It's also easy to breathe because there is an exhaust valve uh, underneath. It offers a greater filtration than the N95, being up to 100. You can use it for a prolonged period of time, and it's durable. It can be repeatedly used, cleaned, disinfected, stored, and reused. Okay. Special attention is given to the exhaust valve. So there are a lot of models, like the half-face mask, with uh, accessory filters which you can buy. This is a thin filter. The one in the middle picture is a canister-type N95 filter is thicker, or you can just put a mask over the exhaust valve or cut a piece of N95 and tape it up around the exhaust valve. So what filters do we use for this uh, mask? We have three types, the cartridge type, which is 100. Then we have the soft, uh, flexible pancake type, which is also a P100. And there is an N95 type, the 6000 series, with an insert N95 filter, which you can reprocess the same way as you use the N95. But among the three, this is the lightest, the pancake type, and this is the heaviest, the 6000 series. How do you clean the uh, mass? Uh, first, you just clean it with soap and water. If there's some splashes of blood on it, or dirt, you can gently brush it, then afterwards rinse it. Soak it in sodium hypochlorite, which is a free chlorine concentration of 5,000 parts per million for two to five minutes. And afterwards, you rinse it again with water, wipe with a soft cloth, then uh, air dry. An alternative is to use the UV cabinet. So you clean it first, wipe with soft cloth, air dry again, and put it inside the cabinet for 15 minutes. This model actually has an air drying uh, component to it. So if it's a little wet, you can put it inside, then air dry it first, then expose it for ultraviolet for 15 minutes. Okay. What are the precautions uh, when cleaning the mask? Uh, don't use alcohol. So this picture has been circulating in uh, different fiber groups. So I pity the surgeon who owns this. It's quite expensive nowadays. Uh, before the pandemic, this was actually selling for only around 4,000. But early March to April, this was selling already at 10,000 pesos. And now I think the retail price is around 15,000. And that is if you can get one. Okay. There are some do-it-yourself um, uh, types of uh, UVC uh, sterilization. Like one of our surgeons bought a portable cooler bag from SNR. Then bought a small uh, portable UV light, put it inside together with your gadgets, close it and expose it for 15 minutes. This one I just saw last night uh, advertised. It's very cheap and it's a sterilizing box made of plastic. The efficiency of these two is not really uh, determined as of now. How do you disinfect the filters? For the cartridge type, it's very easy. You just wipe it with 70% alcohol and air dry. For the two others, the pancake filter and the N95 Series 6000, you clean it the same way or you disinfect the same way as you do for the N95. 
So steroid, UV radiation, or the brown bag technique. So when to replace the filters? So 3M recommends when it's uh, already difficult to breathe comfortably. This may vary from individual to individual. And when the fil filters are dirty and damaged, and for the P100 series, you can use it to 40 hours continuously or 30 days, whichever comes first. Okay. Thank you. That's all. We will now go to the fourth and final um, lecture to be delivered by Regent and Dr. Rodney Dufitas, who will be speaking about calls and surgical gown specifications, all you need to know. I, I was actually, uh, I would like to first of all thank uh, all the board, uh, members of the Board of Regents present here because uh, they uh, significantly uh, had a great impact and input on, on this guideline. I'd also like to give my commendation to the Surgical Infection Committee and the uh, PCS Research Committee. Thank you very much for uh, the two heads and all the members. So uh, it's been quite a long lecture. I was actually toying with the idea if we could just uh, relax a bit and stand in our place so that uh, we could uh, relax uh, and have, do not have such information overload. Anyway, my lecture is uh, uh, all you need to know. And uh, it won't uh, take very long, but I hope this uh, will gather all your interest. I hope, Jeff, you could help me run my slides. Thank you. So the purpose of the gowns and coverall is to provide an artificial integument. So that's how I imagine myself when I'm inside a gown or a coverall. It's an extra layer or barrier for me uh, between the surgeon, the patient, and the COVID-19 uh, virus. So I'm very safe when I'm inside it. So all about gowns. There are three types of gowns, uh, basically, as we all know. Uh, for almost all surgeons, you're very uh, familiar with the disposable surgical gown. For almost all surgeons too, you are uh, very familiar with the cotton reusable surgical gown. And of course, uh, in our we see a lot of this before outside the OR, in the labs. Uh, what we now see are the very thin ones and I, what we call now an isolation gown. Next slide. So they are made of a non-woven polypropylene material and they are for single use. They uh, should be long sleeve. They're tied at the back. They usually only reach at the mid calf cover. That's why you have to have a dedicated shoe. In fact, a, a bit of a boot and then a shoe cover would be good. It should be durable. Breathable meaning uh, there are pores within the fabric or the fiber. That's uh, how it means. And it is uh, water and blood resistant. Next slide, please. But do not forget, because as mentioned earlier by Dr. Joy Jerusalem, we could be in a contingency or a crisis mode. Don't forget the cotton gowns that we use. They're actually polyester now or a combination of polyester cotton. They're, uh, what, their utility is that they're washable and reusable. They're again long sleeve. They're tied at the back. They're mid-calf cover, lightweight, durable, breathable, and to a certain extent, uh, water and blood resistant. Next slide, please. So just putting them all in comparison so it's easy to see. This is uh, one of our take-home important slides. So where do you use each one? So for the... I think you could use all of them in the same manner. You know, it, whether it be in the emergency room, as a triage officer, in your office, when you see a COVID-positive patient, 
uh, when you're in the operating doing surgery or when you do patient visits or rounds. So uh, comparing the three in terms of safety, we all know that the best is the polypropylene surgical gown. And uh, it's much better because uh, it's uh, thicker than the isolation gown. And it's also much, much better than the cotton gown because it's a bit of an absorbent. Um, it is uh, water and blood repellent. Uh, it has a three-star rating compared to the isolation gown and the cotton gown, which is an absorbent. It is, uh, when you say impermeable, as uh, described earlier, it means water passing through after pressure. They are not. They are just water repellent, but not water impermeable. So, but in terms of availability, as we said, they are in a crisis mode. That's where the cotton gowns naman may lamang. It's very available. And the, the blue uh, surgical gown and the isolation gown are supplier dependent. And in terms of reuse, they're usually disposable, single use, but the cotton gown, of course, is uh, washable and being reused. Next slide, please. So when gowns are in short supply, very super crisis situation, there are other, you could use your this uh, reusable uh, lab suit, lab gown. You could also have a disposable lab gown or in the far right of your screen that the uh, health worker is wearing an apron. I think aprons are good. We could even see aprons being used in the SENDU, Central Endoscopy Unit. Next slide, please. So these are important tips on the appropriate use of gowns. So, you wear ground, but you must have a scrub suit uh, beneath it when you're, use, when you're in the emergency room or in the operating room. Of course, when you're seeing a patient, it could be your normal office uh, clothes. But of course, you'll be going home. That's why I said you must bring a scrub suit, better safety. Uh, in a conventional capacity situation, you could use the surgical gown or the isolation gown. But in a contingency capacity situation, especially in uh, many hospitals, government hospitals, you shift gown use towards the use of cloth gown. So entry uh, to a room or an area of a suspect or confirmed COVID patient, you can use clean or isolation gown because the presumption is that you're just having a short visit. But if you have to have a close contact you're doing post-op rounds, you'll be touching the patient. You have, you have to have two layers of gown, which is actually basically a level three PPE already. Next slide, please. So when you are in close contact with a COVID, COVID suspect or confirmed case, you have to use, you are advised to use two layers of gowns as much as possible. If available, you may opt to use two polypropylene gowns. Or you may combine, that's what we did in our hospital at the early days of uh, the COVID crisis. Because uh, the polypropylene gown was so much more difficult, even more difficult than a overall to procure. So you combine the use of polypropylene made gowns with cotton made gowns. So how do you do it? Next slide, please. If a combination of cotton made gown and a polypropylene made gown is needed to be used, because it is water and blood repellent, use the polypropylene gown as first layer. And the, use the cotton gown as a second layer. Because if it's easily stained or soiled, you could replace and throw it immediately. It's not the other way around. Next slide, please. So in the operating room, what do, how do we do it? So in the donning area, you don an unsterile surgical gown first as a first layer of protection after you have already scrubbed. And then you proceed to the operating cubicle for another layer of sterile gowning process. Next slide, please. 
And probably for all of you, you'll be a lot interested in the cover also. I had a lot of fun reading about it. Uh, and I would like to give a shout out to all my fellow uh, co-regents because uh, they made me aware of the HDPE, remember? High density polyethylene material. That's the most important material. It is a non-woven fabric. And uh, this makes it uh, different from any other. Uh, other materials of similar grade are polypropylene fiber with polyethylene coating. So polyethylene or polypropylene fiber with polyethylene coating. That's the very crucial terminology. Breathable, meaning inside there is still a little bit of uh, pore in the fabric. It is lightweight. It is uh, water-based liquid and aerosol repellent. It has low tinting, tunneled elastication at wrist, ankles, face, and thumb loops. The ideal color is white or light blue, actually. And ideally for single use. The ideal color is white so that you could easily spot any stain immediately or light and or even light blue material next slide please so there are three situations actually in my mind where the surgeons will use a cover all when you are performed other than this you may use a level three the surgical gown double surgical gown first is you are performing a surgery on a confirmed covid positive patient Second, if you're, per, uh, and this is in only one area, when we are performing a procedure with the risk of splashing or spraying of blood and other bodily fluids. So you use a cover all because you, it provides, as Joy, uh, Dr. Jerusalem said, 360 protection. Next slide, please. The second situation is uh, even if you're a surgeon, you may be assigned in the emergency room or maybe it's your patient where you will do either uh, endoscopy, intubation, or even uh, mechanical ventilation. So you will do an AGT, uh, an aerosol generating procedure. So you must make sure that you're wearing a coverall in this area because of the aerosolation. Uh, phenomenon. Next slide, please. And the third is because a surgeon may be assigned uh, in the ward or in the intensive care unit to care for a COVID positive patient. So you are actually holding, maybe placing an NGT, monitoring. So the, if you're a surgeon of this type, it's recommended for you to wear a coverall. Next slide, please. So I saw it earlier, there was a question. Is uh, it possible to reuse, uh, reuse or reprocessing of coverall is uh, acceptable in severe shortage, but they're usually only one use and are disposed in uh, our institution, in our level for uh, PPE I've never uh, seen, no? being used by a surgeon. I have to clarify it, being used by a surgeon, being reused or reprocessed. But there are other health workers in the area, like the cleaners, like the per person who will just take uh, blood samples, the respiratory therapist, probably rad tech, who will be there in a short, so short period, so it could be reprocessed. So you initially wash with soap, detergent, and water, followed followed by disinfection, and then uh, rinsing with water, and finally, air sand drying. So the disinfection alternatives is a use of a 0.1% sodium hypochlorite for five minutes, or soak with 3% hydrogen peroxide for 30 minutes. So these alternatives actually just come crop, cropping up, cropping up. So if you're a surgeon, be very familiar with this disinfection processes and alternatives because it's also being used in the uh, eye uh, face shields, in the mask, and in the, in the uh, respirators that you have, and also with the cover all that you have. Next slide, please. So what about the Filipino ingenuity? I, of course, made in the Philippines. 
black trash bag, pa-picture ka agad siya. No? So, it's made of plastic. Actually, it's waterproof, but Again, it's not breathable. There are no pores in a plastic, so sobra ang pa pawis mo dun. It's a 360 coverage, but how long can you stay in it? No? Again, it's very thin and easily torn. And when actually you sew it in terms of a uh, gown, the edges and the seams are a potential source of leak. There are many other types of uh, plastic that are used, the polyvinyl with fabric uh, backing, and they're also being used. No? Next slide, please. And I could, uh, after that, there are so many, I don't know, groups, health workers having pictures of themselves in the social media, iba ibang level of uh, types of. Uh, coveralls that they present, pagalingan ng pose, pagalingan ng color. Uh, uh, and then even, next slide please. Next slide please. Even posing as superheroes, of course, our way of uh, psychologically coping up with all our problems. Anong masasabi natin dito? Next slide please. There was even a uh, fashion designer who had a uh, connection, she's UK-based, made a design, worked with the office of the vice president, and this, are her, this is her design. Next slide, please. Another couple, uh, both doctors, they have a factory in the uh, east of Manila. They made all, instead of clothes, they made all hazmat, uh, coveralls. Next slide, please. So this is a very important slide. What are their materials? Yun lang naman ang ano eh. So we, in all the literature that they wrote, their, their materials are able to resist soaking from blood and other fluids. But their materials are non-medical grade. Why? Because they tried to source, you go a little bit down. I did not want to mention it. Uh, sorry, Jeline, but this is all in their literature. They were sourcing for Tyvek. That's the polyethylene I mentioned in the first uh, slide I had about coveralls. That's the uh, important uh, material. It's not locally it cannot, not locally available. So what the, there are two materials being used locally. The tafeta, which is a commonly used fabric for umble umbrellas and drain coats and even parachutes. So just imagine it is water repellent. It is like nylon coated with polyurethane. And the other is, uh, the first they use Taslan. It's a uh, nylon fabric too with a matte surface. It's synthetic and water repellent. So these are the two materials. They are uh, admittedly non-medical grade as all the uh, producers or manufacturers uh, admit. PPE is made from alternative materials, can be reused and disinfected. So again, that's why I said I clarified it. Uh, in these types, we use it for other people who are not in direct contact with the patient. Or if they are ever in contact for a very short period of time, less than four hours. Next slide, please. So I again get... Uh, news in Rappler or in magazines, there are firefighters who are doing disinfectant from the LGUs and they are also posing with the uh, different types of PPE that are uh, being uh, given to them. So next slide, please. So those PPEs are actually of the same material as the reusable, reusable shopping bags that uh, we are very familiar with if we are now going to the groceries and nowadays we bring our own reusable shopping bags. Those are the same materials as the PPE we said a slide before. Next slide, please. So they are non-woven polypropylene. These are the same material used in the reusable shopping bags. They are made from thermoplastic polymers. They are recyclable and re reusable. They can be washed if they are used in minimal risk areas. As mentioned by Dr. Raida, there are different types of risk areas that you will have to remember. 
And these types of coveralls are not meant for health workers who come into the direct contact with an infected patient. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, of course, we've heard it uh, uh, in the media, the DTI, the IATF, the Department of Health had a press conference. Uh, a factory in the Philippines uh, produced 10,000 medical grade PPE coveralls. This is the only and the first Filipino made PPE that's accepted. Uh, but researching to it, all they said was that uh, the convention of wearing uh, of wearing of uh, some sort of materials, the Conweb, it's a uh, group of uh, exporters they were able to source medical grade materials they did not mention what type so because of the availability of medicaid grade materials which they were able to import the availability of this made them to have a medical grade fluid impermeable textile so this is already now being produced in the philippines and being used in some hospitals and I think the last slide that I have is my most important slide and a take-home slide for all of you. How to test your coverall. So after our, our talk, I think you will go into your different uh, hospitals, get your different coveralls, test whether they are true level four or not. There are two tests actually, and I was surprised. First that we use, I hope Dr. Alahos, I will answer your question. Drop test. So you pour water. So if it's a water repellent, you just repel water. It is resistant to wetting. Nagpo flow down na lang yung tubig. But if it, it's uh, the other type is the waterproof and breathable fabric, the initial one, the white one I showed you, and the one produced by DTI, it also repels water and highly resistant to wetting. And in the Philippine General Hospital, we use the faucet test, actually, when there is a donor. So a faucet test is, means a resistant to water penetration or pressure. So we get the PPE that was donated, put it in the nozzle of the faucet, and open, open uh, it on. If you will see, I, it's just a water repellent fabric, which we see in so many PPs that were donated. There is a hydrostatic pressure, and then the water will flow through, will seep in. But if it's uh, made of a uh, um, the uh, material that is uh, recommended, even if there is a strong external hydrostatic pressure, I use it. I use a water hose at home. I put it in the white hazmat that I have. Even under external strong hydrostatic pressure, no water will pass through. It's really impermeable. So that is how you'll see that's the true level for coverall that you have. So I hope that's my take-home message. At home, you could easily now do this. You could check your own level of protection. At the end of the day, it's the level of protection you have and the risk that you want to see in your patient and how you manage the risk and how you will use it for the advantage of yourself and your safety. Uh, thank you very much for sharing what we have, what we all know and what we have read. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Davidas. It has been a very fruitful day. Not too much information, but that's a lot of information that everybody appreciates. There was an early question from past president, Dr. Chrysostomo, regarding the enforcement of the guidelines. You know, we all know that hospitals, institutions also create their own guidelines. Societies also have their own guidelines. So who enforces what and what will be the penalties or what will be the actions taken if you don't adhere to the guidelines? Does anybody have an answer to that? Because I personally had a problem with DOH um, taking initiative in um, endorsing guidelines. No? Medyo nahuhuli DOH, mahirap tayo. Mag mahirap sila mag-endorse ng guidelines eh. Especially since they started that clearinghouse for guideline creation. And there was an early question too about field health coverage for PPEs. Tataas ba ang case rate packages dahil alam natin gagastos tayo lahat? 
So, Joy, Dr. Philip. I'll just uh, give my two cents worth to the question. I think it's, uh, uh, you could see for all these past years, the last year, the many years ago, how uh, our, our PCS presidents, officers, and the Board of Regents has done a lot of spade work in uh, putting PCS closer to DOH and closer to uh, the policymakers of government, not only uh, not only DOH, PhilHealth, IATF uh, nowadays. Such the and of, as mentioned by Regent uh, Montenegro at the start, how our society has made all the guidelines despite the limitations, but very productive so that. Uh, the public will, the public, the patients, the hospitals, and uh, our policy makers at DOH will be using this. In terms of enforcement, of course, that will still again be a lot of speed work that we have to do. And uh, one, the, this webinar is one also uh, one of the important ways to do it because a learned a surgeon telling his hospital administrator, this is what I've learned in the webinar of PCS, is a very strong voice that we will uh, protect ourselves and uh, protect our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. So additional teeth, ano, pag may background tayo. There were quite a number of questions about the use of elastomeric masks. Are they for, should all surgeons get it? Because I personally saw that my, all my anesthesiologists are now bringing elastomeric masks into the OR. But for surgeons, would you recommend that all surgeons wear these masks? Or even snorkels and scuba, SCBA? Dr. Mendoza, probably? Yeah, uh, these are alternatives, actually. Um, it's easier to use. No? It's, it's very convenient. There's no fogging. There's no CO2 retention. So it's good if your hospital will approve uh, of uh, using them. But some strict hospitals with infection control do not recommend or do not allow elastomeric masks. But if they allow it, it's, it's really good. You just have to cover the exhaust valve no, to prevent uh, you contaminating other health workers or even the patient. Okay, yes. There are a lot of them with exhaust valves and people forgot that that's going to let the germs out. There was a question also regarding using ultraviolet for sterilization of the elastomeric mass. Uh, actually, uh, the best is to soak in, soak it, clean it first and soak it in sodium hypochlorite. Then uh, another uh, additional re-sterilizations after you do that, put it in a UV cabinet so it would add some more. But UV itself actually isn't really that recommended by infection uh, disease uh, personnel. Somebody also asked, there's also a question about ozone for sterilization. Uh, ozone is actually, I think it's a gas. No? It can deodorize, sanitize. Uh, they claim to kill 99.9% .9 of uh, bacteria and viruses. No? Uh, but uh, the efficacy, actually, there's, I haven't gone into any study with the coronavirus, whether it's safe to use for coronavirus. Okay, there are a lot of concerns about you know, harmful effects of ozone, too. So it's probably, that's why it hasn't really caught on much. They actually used it during the SARS, uh, the SARS epidemic. There's mm -hmm. also one there's question uh, uh, with a mask or an N95. If you can use, if you can just uh, leave it in the car and expose the car outside, sun. Uh, you can do that, but the problem is it's like an oven. You have to decontaminate the car also afterwards. No? Um, you should be breathing in all the germs. Yes. That the virus is. So it's, it's safer to put it in a brown bag. No? Uh, there's also a question with the N95, why five to seven days? Actually, since the virus dies in 72 hours, uh, three, four days is actually okay. Na. But if you want to be extra safe, then if you have five pieces a month or seven for the week, then Consume it for the whole week para hindi nakakalito. One for Monday, one for Tuesday, one for... And so on and so forth. No? You mark na sa labas, no? Susulatan mo na ano yes. Monday group. You have to mark. Yeah. There's a question here about returning to electives. So I think that's also a very big concern, no? About the PPEs that you will use when you will start doing your elective surgeries when there is still the COVID-19 lurking around. Who can give, um, probably, Ida? Can you... um, hello again. So as, sorry, uh, I'm in JR. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned earlier, no, um, more important 
then the PP alone would be our administrative controls and the engineering controls. So as, uh, by this time, we should be preparing already guidelines. Now, once the OPD would resume, um, what would be the policies there? Yung advice nga is uh, you utilize telemedicine to screen your patients. Um, be sure that those that you would um, ask to come to the hospital have a test or, or do not have any COVID symptoms. And then you assign um, clinic schedules, no? um, cohort your patients. You clean cases, they go on this day. Uh, those with possible respiratory symptoms, possibly uh, with some symptoms, you ask them to go on this day so that you would be prepared with the proper PPE. And also engineering controls. So you have prepared the place, the OPD, you have um, adequate um, exhaust, ventilation, negative pressure rooms, et cetera. So we still have the time to prepare you know, before that time comes. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Um, our last question is, this is a very interesting question, a very practical question. If, not, if the mask or the PPE is not medical grade, will it really protect you against COVID? Okay, Joy. Um, possibly for ano ma'am, uh, dun sa lecture na, if it's not medical grade, it's usually uh, the use is limited to isolation purposes. Maybe uh, if you're not in a high risk environment, you're not in the hospital. But of course, it, most of us will find ourselves in the hospital and in high risk areas. So tayo yung mga healthcare personnel, we really have to invest in a good N95 mask or a medical grade mask. Okay. Thank you so much. Parang ang feeling natin lahat, ano, we would like to have the best protection available, but any protection is better than no protection at all yes. in any crisis situation. So I think we have a very full day. It's almost time. But for our closing remarks, we'll be presenting an artificial presentation from our sponsor, Menarini. We have to thank them and, of course, our platform, the Telemedicine Network of the Philippines, for allowing us to successfully hold this uh, webinar. And also, Dr. Salud is here also, Tara. Oh. I'm Dr. Salud. Thank you so much for, for listening in. Yeah, some comments, maybe. Yes, maybe Dr. Salud will give me some message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, muna na muna ang Menarini and uh, whoever else. They can go ahead. Foundation has been a, uh, a very spectacular idea to improve uh, all of our knowledge about the pharmacology and the uh, clinical medicine. Foundation Menarini is a unique organization with no commercial bias, no commercial interest. It is putting together some of the best learning events in the country, outside the country, worldwide.
Thank you. So, a last few words from Dr. Salud, the president of the Philippine College of Surgeons. Oh, good morning. Uh, it's close to noon time. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you once again for attending uh, this morning's uh, webinar. Um, we don't know all the answers. Fortunate, unfortunately, this, uh, this virus caught us unprepared. And even in the past two months that we have been trying to learn everything that we could about it, we still don't know everything um, about the virus and how to take care of it. And, and, and in fact, the next few weeks is critical when we start opening up uh, our clinics and the operating rooms for elective procedures, if you are, you are capable of already doing that. But uh, we still have to do a lot of study on this. The Board of Regents and all the committees of the college are still uh, judiciously working on the different uh, aspects of surgical care. So we won't rest here. We will continue to provide information to all our fellows. I'd like to thank all our panelists and lecturers this uh, morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee on surgical research headed by Joy Jerusalem and the committee members and the regent in charge Rodney. I'd like to thank Esther Sagil, the committee on surgical infection chairman. Uh, it's regent in charge Boogie and the different uh, committee members. Of course, we'd like to thank Menarini, TNP. And I'd like to remind everyone that we have another webinar next Friday. I believe it is on, uh, on topics on head and neck. So it could be it could uh, provide more information for all the fellows and uh, all the surgeons in the land. And uh, just to give you an, uh, in some uh, information, we will be having our media convention online on May 28 and 29. So please uh, calendar this uh, for everyone, not just the residents, not just the fellows, but the residents and all surgeons in the land. So Esther, maraming salamat for the work with your, that you did today. All the lecturers, maraming salamat po. And all those who attended, again, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chito. Thank you for all the, to the, all the panelists, all the attendees. Uh, it's been a very fruitful day. And we'd like to say goodbye now. Thank you to Merini, Menarini, and everybody keep safe. Bye. Doctora, picture taking tayo lahat. <laughs>